Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Mind Muscle Connection podcast. Today I have a very special guest, Sam Miller. He's back on for the second time. Last time we had him all was episode 142, so it's been a little over a year. But just for anybody who's not familiar with Sam, he has more than a decade of experience as a health, fitness, and nutrition coach. He's a certified nutritionist and licensed board certified health practitioner who holds a master's degree from North Carolina State University. And he's also the creator of FNMS and the host of the Sam Miller Science Podcast. So Sam, welcome back on, man. Thanks, man. Yeah, I think I even, I was hanging out with you, I think before the book even went live. Yep. So when we did the first intro versus now, it's probably the biggest change was metabolism made simple, but otherwise pretty much the same, just a year older and wiser. I think we did the last one last summer too. Yeah, it was like springish time. I know we we talked about stress. So if you guys are interested in hearing about that, Sam's obviously super knowledgeable in that. But yeah, the book's out. So I was just going to do a general update on you in, in that time span. So you had the book come out. How did that go? Maybe you want to fill the audience in on the book. And what's involved there with that? Yeah, sure. So the book came out in November of 2022. So shortly after hanging out with Jeff and talking about stress. And my main focus with that is just simplifying a lot of the concepts we hear related to nutrition and really zooming in on combination of nutrition, a little bit on movement, and then also stress and managing that, which we covered in Jeff's podcast, which is a good primer to that. Book release was great. It was nice to have that finally off my plate. And it's very similar to a fitness transformation where you know, delayed gratification is key. You kind of work, you show up to the gym every day, you eat your meals, you do things you're supposed to do, but there's not always that like instant reward or feedback as far as progress in your health and fitness journey. Sometimes you hit plateaus and stuff, but then ultimately you can hit your goal if you're working at it long enough. And so the book was a really cool experience for me and just something different as far as industry contribution goes. I've still been doing my podcast and mentorship a lot of time going there. And then really for me, large focus with just my team and then doing some different speaking and things like that. But I'm pretty, I feel like once I get in a routine, I'm just doing my thing, which is where you and I are usually chatting about like training and nutrition and stuff. Yeah. And for anybody too, who's not familiar with Sam. So I did, so Sam was a mentor of mine. I did his FN, FNMS program as well as did some business mentoring there as well too, like one-on-one. And I feel like for you, the big kind of thing that I learned from FNMS was like just goes a lot deeper than macros and calories. I feel like you're very good at explaining that and helping people understand that. And for me, it's just been a really invaluable tool to add to help with clients. It just has given me a different perspective and to dive just a little bit deeper than, hey, we need to drop your calories or, hey, we need to move a little bit more. There's more to it. And we're going to hit on one of those topics today in gut health, but I just wanted to point that out because it, it definitely goes a lot deeper than that. And I'm also always amazed by all the things that you get done in, 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 in the amount of time too. Like you said, what, like three podcasts a week you're putting out and it seems like it's staying pretty consistent there with that. Yeah. you So typically three podcasts a week and then teaching inside the program and then just other content and work inside the business as well. Then just life as dog dad, I guess. But as far as my work, it really is bridging that gap between macro coaching and focusing on not only your health and your fitness goals that you have, but under understanding why things are the way they are, why things are happening, right? So yes, you may need a deficit for your goals, but how do we structure that optimally for you based on your health history? Or let's say you are interested in building muscle. Let's figure out based on your training history, your training age, your health history, what's going to be optimal, most conducive for you to do that while also maybe if your goal is to stay as lean as possible while you're maybe in that phase, right? Or Maybe previously, anytime you've tried to gain muscle, you had gut issues or when you go into a deficit, you notice poor biofeedback or something like that. So it's not to negate the importance of those primary nutritional principles of energy balance and macronutrition, but also considering, okay, within our macronutrient budget, what are we doing with our micronutrients? What are we doing in terms of maybe meal composition or spacing or timing around to optimize workout recovery or Are we sleeping appropriately and managing our stress? And really that's where you mentioned gut health, Jeff. And I think some people miss the low hanging fruit when it comes to their gut health. And if you're solely coming from the perspective of all you've done in the past is tracking your macros, even though that's a great gateway into the fitness and nutrition industry, you are missing some deeper components that might explain why from time to time, maybe you don't have the best digestion or you're noticing variances in terms of bowel movements or gas or indigestion or discomfort or bloating or constipation or anything like that. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And it, yeah, diving a little bit deeper, I think it's been super helpful. But then on the other side of the spectrum, you have people that maybe then they fall too far on the functional side of things, right? And it's like all these like detoxes, typical protocol, like just like 
cookie cutter protocols. And then it's too far on the functional side of things. So like you said, you bridge that gap there and you find a good happy medium to bulls. And I think that's super helpful. And I know for you, again, the big thing is also like just diving deeper into the client situation rather than, hey, here's a specific protocol that we're going to do. We have principles, but it's not just this is what we're going to follow every single time. It's diving deeper and learning a little bit more about the client. And again, this is why I wanted to bring you on to talk about gut health, because I think that a lot of things do fall in that, hey, here's a protocol that you're going to do, follow it, and then you're good to go. But it's a little bit deeper than that. Before we dive into the gut health stuff, I told you off air, I always like to ask the guests I have on what they're doing on their side of things with training and nutrition. I know you post about it a little bit. I see you post some training videos on social media from time to time, but I'm curious to hear how that's going for you. Anything specific that you're working on there? And yeah, just chat about that a little bit. Yeah. So training wise, I would say I'm usually pretty consistent with four or five days a week of resistance training. And then usually what keeps me outside, I enjoy either going for a walk with the dogs or I'll listen to a podcast, get outside, get some movement in. I have occasionally, I think when I'm good about it, I'll, I may do a single yoga class with the resistance training, walking. I do have a sled here and some other things I can do for some either intervals or just general conditioning and stuff like that. But I keeping it pretty basic at this point in time. And I usually like to structure it where if I go to a commercial gym or something, I'm doing it during off peak hours on maybe a Friday, Saturday or Sunday. And then I'm typically training with, I wouldn't say it's minimal equipment, but I do train at home probably three days a week. And so with structuring that, I'm trying to figure out best split given that equipment. And then the fact that I do like to hit some different accessory things that I don't have at home. So that might be different machines or cables or maybe a dumbbell size that I don't have in my garage or a better rack setup than what I'm currently working with. So I've had to be adaptable with that as I kind of work into the structure because this is my first sort of not even, it really hasn't even been a year yet. So first six months of really training that way. And if you were following like a 12 week program, I've really only had two blocks of that essentially to figure out and dabble with what's the best structure given that I like to be pretty well-rounded with things. I pretty much keep my frequency usually about one and a half to two times per body part per week across various splits and then gauging my recovery and biofeedback. I may back things down or not. My biggest additions, really, I hadn't been doing much on on kind of the yoga front. It was more of a challenge for me because I'm not the most mobile person in the world. And uh, work was at a point where it was like, even with my training, I felt like I was getting interrupted with messages or phone calls or I needed to do something or respond to something. And so forcing yourself, especially with going in like a hot room or something, you have to leave your phone was super helpful for me to like disconnect from technology just as a parasympathetic activity. So doing that. Nutrition, I've been around maintenance for a good bit now just because I don't really, I may go into a mild deficit here or there, but maintenance has really been best for me ever since, uh, actually we're talking about gut health and stuff today, like ever since getting into a really good place with my gut health, I've tried to stay pretty close to maintenance calories just because maintaining that optimal digestion is really important for me. And it can be set off with whether it's work stress or travel and different things like that. So trying to keep that pretty steady Nutrition wise, other than trying out some like higher protein, I bought one of those like Ninja Creamy things. So I've been playing around with some higher protein, gut friendly Ninja Creamy protein based ice cream because it's hot where I live right now. So doing that, but mostly training four or five days a week and pretty much around maintenance. But my training right now is like how to get the most out of that equipment that I have and figuring out that's been a fun thing for me is like discovering that new sort of optimal training split to where I can have fun in the gym a day or two, if I meet up with a friend or I do my own thing, sometimes I'll bring one of my dogs to the gym. And then in the garage, it's just like maximizing what I have with the time I have and figuring out, okay, is there another piece of equipment I want to add here? Or how do I structure this in a way where I'm getting the most bang for my buck overall? So that's been pretty cool. Oh, yeah. So it sounds like it's more like just general health versus aesthetic or is it maybe a combination? I still do more hypertrophy training, I would say. If there's been any change, like I might be doing a little more unilateral stuff, but I definitely am doing probably more like hypertrophy or strength hypertrophy. And aesthetics wise, I think because I'm relatively comfortable with my body composition, I can stay pretty close to maintenance. And then for me, because I as I shifted to things like books and podcasts and content creation, it inherently makes me a little bit more sedentary. So if I need to shift something body composition wise, and usually in a short period, a lot of times it's just like increasing my movement, 
because I notice I'm like, dude, you've been sitting on your ass far too much. Like you need to get outside. So that's my toggle that I'll pull there if I need to control things. And then just being mindful of I've been going out to eat a lot more or preparing more meals at home. Fortunately, I do work with a company now that helps in terms of meal prep and stuff. So I try to always have a pretty controlled lunch or breakfast. And then if I'm at home Monday through Thursday during the week and stuff like dinner as well. So really all that changes for me with nutrition is just if I'm, if I've got work travel or any social plans. And so I'm able to like pretty stay pretty close in terms of what I'm doing overall with protein, carbs, fats, and still keeping an emphasis on food quality and some of the things that we talked about in terms of gut health and digestion. Yeah, I was going to ask you, so it sounds like probably not doing the meticulous tracking maybe that you you did at one point or that some people think you have to do. So is there any goals that you have set with nutrition from day to day or is it, hey, I'm going to try to hit minimums here. I try to keep the same amount of meals or is it just you just rely on the skill that you've built with nutrition over time or what does that look like? Kind of a mix of skill. I used to be the person that we had everything, tracked everything, measured everything, brought meals with me, stressed about missing meals over. I was far too meticulous to a point that it was detrimental. I probably think, I, I'd say it got to a point where me stressing about the food was worse than deviating from the actual meal and just doing my best as I go. It's funny, I was, as I told you, as I was hopping on Zoom, we actually had a team retreat this weekend and I got one person actually did happen to bring a food scale, which is natural when you're like in the health and fitness industry. And I actually, there was a bison burger and I actually managed to get the weight of the burger within oh, nice. like, few grams or ounces. I was like, oh yeah, I think that's about five ounces cooked. Like, why don't you throw it on the scale? See what you think. And I literally had it within 0.01 of it. So I know I've still, I don't really always eyeball. Unfortunately, I do have that meal preparation for lunches at times. But as far as breakfast, to keep that consistent, I always have, I'd say my protein goal is I'm usually not below that one gram per pound. As far as protein, I have certain things that I know work for me in terms of my digestion and gut health. I am big on like fruit intake and getting a variety of fruits and antioxidants and just general nutrients in from that being a single ingredient food and use that as one of my carbohydrate sources. And as far as proteins, I just have my own general preferences. I think I dieted and competed for so long that that'll burn you out on chicken and turkey. I'll incorporate a variety of different lean meats and proteins, ruminants, red meat, fish, things like that for the protein goal. And then I usually have one or two sort of supplementary protein shakes or smoothies or something. I'll use like Legion Whey or plant and get a little bit of additional protein in that way. So that's, yeah, I'd say I have, it's, there's discipline, control and structure, but it's not so meticulous that it drives me nuts. But I'd say protein's kind of that cornerstone. I have my movement that I pretty much is non-negotiable for me. I did notice that my appetite shifted a little bit with doing more cold exposure. So I've had to adjust what I'm doing so I don't let myself get super, super hungry. In 2021, writing the book and into 2022, I was probably doing more time-restricted eating in the morning because I would just get some caffeine and water and then I'd start writing right away. Whereas now I've noticed like kind of my hunger cues have shifted a little bit and I don't abstain from eating quite as long. So probably my biggest shift since the last time we talked is because I'm not doing that writing in the morning, my first meal moved up a little bit earlier. So maybe a change in meal timing, but I'd say overall, like food quality macro composition really hasn't changed too much since I chatted with you. So when you say, and just a couple more things on this before we move on to the topic, when you say you're focused more on maintenance, like what do you, for you, is that just like tracking body weight, making sure that stays within a certain range? Or is there any other way that you track that to make sure that you are around your maintenance? Good question. I'd say, yeah, I will periodically weigh myself. I also obviously can see myself in the mirror and get visual feedback yeah. there, how my clothes fit for a while. I did, I did do in 2022. I know people are going to be like, what the heck? Like functional health, 75 hard, whatever. But just as like a retune from like a discipline perspective, I think after we spoke last year, I did do 75 hard where you take a picture every day. So from a body comp perspective, it does like create awareness around what you're actually doing. So in this overall maintenance phase, I've still had little things that I've done. I did that more so because I, I got 15,000 steps. I was walking as one of my main activities. And then for reading, I had fallen out of the habit of reading every day. So reading 10 pages was really good. And then I just control my exercise intensity to where 
I'm not, I wasn't lifting seven days or 14 days a week. I usually would just do an outdoor walk or something like that. I've had seasons where, yeah, I'm taking progress photos or I'm doing something to establish that maintenance for right now. I'm more so staying within roughly like a three to five pound range in terms of scale weight and then maintenance in terms of food, like calories and nutrition, because I keep my protein controlled. And then because I tend to pick and gravitate towards similar carbohydrate sources and fats when I'm eating at home, my carbs and fats will pretty much be the same based on the meals I'm picking. And then if I notice changes in body composition, appearance, whatever, it's usually as a result of, oh, you had multiple weeks of travel or, oh, your dinner meal changed and on Friday and Saturdays for multiple weeks now, like you haven't been eating at home. So then it becomes really easy to identify, okay, you lost weight. There was a shift in calories on those two days on that, in that meal, Saturday, Sunday, or Friday, Saturday. And then if I gain weight, I'm like, okay, I need to modify that. And maybe I'm going to make choices where I'm focused on more protein and like single ingredient foods versus if you go out to eat and there's just so many things on the menu, you can hardly even track versus if you get steak and a baked potato, like that's pretty easy to track. So I just go back to basic nutritional principles, but from a maintenance perspective, I meant more in terms of my kind of scale weight staying within the same range and the macros are pretty close. And because I do have the I'm very fortunate that I am able to get some meals from the folks at MegaFit. So I, I do typically keep that pretty consistent as far as the amount of carbs and they pre-portion that so that I, I know my protein. And then that's usually at least one of my meals per day. And then I almost always make the same shake. And then I typically will have a meal that has eggs in it. And that's the same because I'm preparing it at home. So there's really not a lot of, there's rotation in foods. But as far as like the targets as a whole, they're pretty similar, which I feel like a lot of my friends now who are in a similar spot, unless they're prepping. I have two friends who are prepping right now. They're doing like summer shredding and stuff and competing later this year. Cody is competing this year. And then I have a friend, Matt, who's prepping. But other than that, I feel like the people who have been in the fitness industry a long time, you move to this approach of your, for the average person, it's like tracking, but it's really hard to explain unless you've tracked food for 10 years. Yeah. I agree. It seems like that typically is a lot of, a lot more of those answers are around, hey, I'm not like pushing anything. It's more so I'm just relying on the skills that I've built over time. And again, I think that's where most people want to get to anyway. So that's that's a great place. If I drastically wanted to change my body composition, I would definitely dial it in a bit more. I think my mental energy and resources, 2021, 2022 was really book focused. And then this year has been really a lot on my team because we have multiple new team members at least two or three within the last six months. And then just other things that have occupied my time to where I'm like, okay, what's the most sustainable thing where I'm not going to screw this up and things that I know work for me based on the past and not getting too fancy with it. And I also, I don't really get bored of that too quickly and I'm pretty adaptable. So that's been helpful for me, but I wouldn't say if you're a beginner listening to this, don't follow my advice, but (laughs) if you've been tracking for eight to 10 years, you might be okay to loosen the reins a little bit. Yeah, rely on that skill and experience. Cool. Always love hearing about what people have been doing with that. It's always interesting to hear people's approaches to it and whatnot. Cool. Let's dive into today's topic. I know you hit on gut health throughout. So that's what I wanted to mainly bring you on here for was gut health today. Kind of talk about that, what it is, misconceptions, stuff like that. So I'm going to hand it over to you and just maybe give a general overview of gut health and maybe just some things that people should know about before we dive into some specific questions on it. Okay. Yes, it's good. So as far as like general overview of gut health, I think framing it as what is good digestion and just starting with overall what should be going on both after meals and also your bowel movements. So in terms of like bowel frequency, usually we're looking to go every day, but not more than three times a day. And if we're going less than three times per week, that's the concern, right? So if you think of your rules of thumb, like if you went, we'll use a little bit of a lifestyle hobby slash sports analogy here. Sometimes if you're going to go bowling and you put the bumpers up, it helps to keep you moving towards the pins. On one side, like our left bumper is like not going more than three times per day. Our right bumper is we don't want to be going less than three times per week. If you occasionally were to miss, you don't go one day, not the end of the world, but ideally we do want to go every day. Depending on the volume of calories you're consuming, the size that you are, how active you are, that may shift for you. And typically if you're consuming more total food, that may change and go up. If you're less familiar with what a good quality bowel movement looks like, the Bristol stool charts are very helpful for that. We don't have to get too far into the science of the podcast, just in or excuse me, the science of the Bristol stool chart on the podcast, just in case you're like cooking breakfast or dinner or something as you listen to this podcast. 
we won't discourage you too much or ruin your appetite overall, but you can just Google it. So if you're someone who's not eating a meal right now, listen to this podcast, I'd encourage you to do that when Jeff and I wrap up chatting today. But I frame it first with that digestive perspective. And then after your meals, we don't want to be overly full, distended, like a little bit of gas on occasion is okay. But if you're always bloated, full, feel like it's to the point where your stomach is like your pants are super tight, that's not great want to avoid that if possible. And typically recurring bloat can be a sign of underlying maybe small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or gut dysbiosis. And we can talk a little bit more about sort of complex cases and conditions as we move through. But the first thing I'm looking at is really biofeedback related to your symptoms after a meal and then having that regular bowel movement consistently, because that's helping us in a number of different perspectives, not only in terms of our gut health, but just full body systems and even in terms of our hormones, right? Because when we go to the bathroom, we excrete things like estrogen. It's basically you're clearing waste from your body. So it's very important. You'll hear people talk about buying a detox or doing a detox or whatever. But if you can, if you're going to the bathroom daily through, obviously if you're going to the bathroom at least once a day or twice a day, that's part of your detoxification in addition to urinating on top of that. So that's your core foundation. And then Biofeedback wise, I like to rate it on a scale in terms of comfortability and things. And then I'll ask maybe if any specific foods or things are causing irritation related to those meals. So if you're having digestive discomfort, I might ask when it's happening, why it's happening, if you know why, if you don't know why, and then we can identify things from there. Well, cool. yeah, no, I love that. I think first, like you said, the frequency aspect is important to note because I think a lot of times if it is like one day, people do start to freak out there and it's one, one day is not an issue. It's like you said, over that week, what, where are you going? If it's less than three, that that's an issue. But also too, quality is going to be super important, how the quality is, right? Making sure that's on point. And then obviously looking at things like you said, the bloating, things like that are also going to be important to, to look at there. So what would you say are like the biggest like myths and misconceptions you get around like gut health, whether that be how people describe it or again, any, anything like fr from that standpoint. So some of the biggest misconceptions I'd say get more towards when people believe that something like I'm not, I'm very pro supplementation, evidence-based supplementation, but sometimes people view gut health as, oh, I take a probiotic or there's they treat it as this thing, as almost like a game of operation. If you think about when we were kids, there was this sort of figure and you would move these different pieces and it was a very precise thing. Gut health is really more like a general, it's a lot of like trends and ratios and a general balance of bacteria. And that bacteria is turning over and changing all the time. If you change your physical environment, it will impact your microbiome. If you change if you got a pet, that will change your microbiome. If you change what you're eating in terms of your food, that will impact the microbiome. If you change your supplements, it will impact the microbiome. So the two biggest things I would say is one, people treating gut health as this like static entity because it's ever adapting and evolving like a lot of human physiology. And then the second part would be that there's some sort of like on off switch of like good gut health, bad health, gut health when really there's a whole recipe, right? So let's say someone has gut issues it could be because of low stomach acid or motility, micronutrient deficiency. There's a lot of things that can exacerbate a gut problem and it can get relatively worse. I think a third misconception would be that all gut health issues, if you arrive at the same place, that you got there the same way. Whereas for one person, maybe they were eating a standard American diet, really poor food quality, and they just have gut issues from that. Maybe for someone else, they had repeat prescriptions of antibiotics. Maybe they've had recurring UTIs, they're prescribed antibiotics, they're high stress, and maybe they weren't doing the appropriate training intensity relative to their recoverability. They were under eating. That person can also end up with gut issues. The two people got to a place of GI upset and dysfunction two very different ways. And so I think there's this misconception that like, and you mentioned it and alluded to it in terms of the protocols that it's, oh, if you have a gut issue, you just do this one thing or you just follow these steps and you take these supplements. But in reality, the person that's under eating and had recurrent antibiotic usage and also was highly stressed probably needs something slightly different than the person who just is eating a Western diet, very processed food, or let's say packaged multi-ingredient foods versus single ingredient whole foods that are protein, micronutrient dense, antioxidant dense. Those are very different food choices. So for the person that I just mentioned, we're just going to work on food quality. For the other person, 
we maybe need to go in and look at their health history and maybe get to a place where, okay, we improve the digestive symptoms, then maybe we're going to reverse a recovery diet or go to a maintenance phase. There's a lot of different levers that you can pull to move someone in the right direction. So those would probably be my three biggest is like gut health is that static entity, either viewing like kind of that game of operation of, oh, I'm just going to take this probiotic and that's going to fix everything, not realizing that the gut is changing and there's a number of things that impact our gut health. And then third would just be that, oh, bad gut health is bad gut health or poor gut health or poor digestion is all one and the same when in the reality is like we can arrive at a place of poor digestion a number of ways. It could be not chewing your food. It could be rushed rushed eating. It could be poor food quality. It could be uh, even like you not responding well to a particular food or ingredient. There's really so many things that could impact how you get there. So that, that would probably be the way to round out my list is with that. Yeah, no, I love all three of those. And I agree with the, I feel like a common thing is, oh, this supplement or something worked for this person. So it's automatically going to work for me. But like you said, just because you're at this point, that doesn't mean that so the way you got there is the same. And so again, this is where like diving into this with the person is super important to see how they got there, right? Like you said, the one person overeating is going to be different than the person that again, maybe stressed out and it's completely different there. So diving into that is, is super important there. While you were talking, this was a question that came up. If you're starting to figure out, hey, I might have poor gut health. And I think one thing you'll see, and this could be a myth or misconception is, do you need to take any like special test or anything like that to find out like what you have going on? Or do you find that might not be very useful there? You can, but you don't have to. I think it can be helpful from the perspective of a client who maybe wants to see information on paper, almost like a report card to create adherence. And I think it can be used a tool to demonstrate change happening over a period of time. But I think if you're experiencing really poor biofeedback, meaning your gut's bothering you, you're having poor digestion, poor bowel movements, gas or distension, bloating, discomfort, your perception is your reality, right? If you're uncomfortable, that's enough of a reason to make a change. And even if the test says you're okay, we might still want to tweak things because we want you to feel better. I, for me, if I had a client like how that client feels is very important to me, probably even more so than just the way that they look. It's equally as important. So that would be something, and you can do testing. So there's a number of different tests that fall into this category known as like 16 PCR. And those can basically look at trends and patterns as it pertains to our gut bacteria. And a lot of people more on the functional integrative or holistic side of the health industry will use these tests and I think they can be informative and powerful tools for the practitioner and the client in a number of ways, but they can also be misused and abused in a way that if it's not used appropriately for nutrition intervention and lifestyle coaching, basically I have seen individuals abusing this and using it as a reason to recommend like 17 different supplements. And I don't agree with that approach. I think if someone is you know, let's say what their afternoon looks like is like rushed eating in the after school pickup line when they're getting their kids and then they're preparing dinner for the family and they're like eating, standing up while their family's at the table and high stress, still consuming a fair amount of alcohol during the week. Maybe we're missing key micronutrients. Maybe we're not having that regular bowel movement or motility, low stomach acid. We have an environment that's basically creating the gut issues that we're experiencing, right? And so we have to use a lifestyle-centered approach as well as nutritional adjustments to make those improvements. And yeah, let's say, is there evidence to support the fact that if someone has a history of antibiotic usage or concurrent with antibiotics, we use something like Saccharomyces as a yeast-based probiotic. Could that be helpful for that person who just took that prescription? Yeah, sure. It totally can be. But usually with folks, there's other things going on than just that one, one problem. And the supplement alone, while it may help stem certain side effects that someone's experiencing, it may not in isolation guarantee good gut health for the rest of your life, right? It's not, I think probiotics can be a bit of an insurance policy in a way or support commensal bacteria, which are good bacteria in your gut, but it shouldn't be the only thing you're doing to have good gut health or quality digestion. So I'd say as far as the tests go, view it as a source of information in addition to your personal experience and what's going on in your day-to-day -day life. I think a really good questionnaire from a coach and an in-depth conversation and session where you're talking about what you're experiencing can be very powerful. 
and testing can basically just be used in conjunction with those things. I don't think testing replaces like a coach client relationship. I also don't think that testing in isolation without nutrition intervention is going to do very much. So we need to really combine the power of testing is really just like an analysis. And then the nutrition, lifestyle, and supplements are what's going to drive the change after that analysis. We also have to understand that if I took that test on, I'm recording this with Jeff on a Tuesday. If I took that test this morning, my own test might be different if I took it again on Thursday or Friday or next week or the week after. I'm the same person, but that sample could be slightly different in terms of the results that I'm seeing. And when I said the game of operation earlier, what I see a lot in the fitness industry is people will get those PCR stool tests and they basically view it as this supplement changes this value of this marker on this thing. And it's like, there might be some evidence to suggest that in research, right? But we don't, we're not like guaranteed that's going to happen with the client. And it's also contingent upon what the client's eating, what's in their environment, what medications are they taking? Are they exercising appropriately, right? So like exercise modulates the gut microbiome, sleep is important, systemic inflammation and other things going on in the body. So I try not to look at that in isolation and more so use it as it can be a helpful indicator or for clients who need sort of a reason to adhere to a temporarily more stringent dietary approach. I think it gives them a concrete piece of evidence that like dysfunction is present because some people begin to normalize irregular bowel movements or they normalize gas or they normalize bloat and oh, I just always feel this way. So being able to substantiate that with a test is helpful. And so you're using it more as a tool to substantiate some of the symptoms they've experienced and make it a serious concern to where they, they may be more likely to make a change versus not making the change. So I think that's one way it can be used as a powerful tool, but some people over, I think there's a lot of overstated promises when it comes to those things at times or the supplements that are recommended uh, on top. Yeah, no, I love that. So it sounds like you can do it. Again, I would imagine it probably is dependent on, okay, if you want to pay for it, because from my understanding, these tests are usually pretty, they're not on the cost effective side bucks. of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and like now, if you were things. torn between the two, I'd hire a coach versus, or talk to somebody versus getting the test. Now, if you're in a place where you have the discretionary income to do both, then, you know, maybe grab a coach who can interpret your test and do both. I don't think it's a bad thing to have information about your health but it's not like a guaranteed promise of, it's not the end of the journey. It's just like the starting point of where you're going to have information. Just if you gave a coach an intake form or answered a questionnaire. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I'm sure some of these things that we'll talk about that you can do are probably like low hanging fruit things that will, that may help it without even having to get this test and, and whatnot. Just maybe if you could briefly hit on like common issues that you see again is what are the like, I guess in this space, in terms of people looking to have a body transformation, like what are the most common symptoms that you'll see or like issues, not necessarily symptoms, you've talked about the symptoms, but like the most common issues that you'll see that arise. And if you don't mind also then hitting on like the most common reasons you see why this pops up. And I know you hit on it throughout, but yeah. Yeah. So the most common reason I'd say some of these things will pop up is just overall like standard American diet, first and foremost, like not emphasizing food quality or someone who's playing like macro Tetris. So even though you may be in the fitness industry and you're hitting your nutritional targets, your overall food quality or proportion of like single ingredient foods to high things with a laundry list of ingredients and relatively low micronutrient density, that's pretty high. I'd say not chewing your food, lack of attentive eating, maybe sedentary lifestyle. So if you're not walking and exercising, that can definitely impact your gut health. And on top of that, I would say on the other end of the spectrum, I do see a lot of people who are maybe like plant-based dieters or people who are going in as a way to try to manage their appetite. They're consuming like large amounts, either their fibers like off the charts, like it's 80 grams of fiber and they just can't tolerate it. So they think it's more of a good thing, right? Just so if some fiber is good, m more fiber, having all my fiber from carbs is better, which I don't agree with at, at all, actually. And it can be actually quite irritating for some people. I'd say that's definitely an issue. Imbalanced, soluble, insoluble fiber can be a problem. And other than that, like heavy plant-based eating, macro composition, timing of meals, 
probably overtraining relative to your recovery bandwidth or like poor sleep and abusing caffeine. So I, I think I'm somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10 things I just listed, but the, I don't know if you want to parse through those individually, but I'd say the abusing caffeine, high training intensity, low recoverability, the diet choices related to fiber and things like that, poor diet quality or standard American diet can definitely lead to it. And just chewing your food, high stress, those are probably the most common surface level drivers of basic GI discomfort and will eventually lead to dysfunction if they're left alone long enough. And that will usually present itself, as we mentioned before, irregularity in the Bristol stool chart, infrequent bowel movements or going to the bathroom too frequently, uh, poor, you're not having solid bowel movements, but you're having loose bowel movements. You could have gas, bloating, distension, the indigestion. Those are the most common symptoms along with maybe like poor skin, hair, nails, things like that, because we're not optimally absorbing our micronutrients. So those are most common symptoms and most common reasons why I tend to see some of the symptoms that I listed. No, that was that was awesome. And like the biggest thing that I wanted you to hit on was like, I feel like a lot of times people just think that if they're trying to work on their body composition and they do some of these, it's, oh, hey, I'm not going to have issues with gut health. But like, there's a lot of things on here where it's like you said, you could be somebody that you're tracking your calories and macros, but you're playing macro Tetris, right? You're missing out on maybe your food quality is not there. Or even the one, like you said, the fiber aspect where it's, oh, hey, more fiber is better. So I'm just going to like food volume everything. And then that's maybe certain foods don't fit well with you. So I just wanted you to hit on that just because you're make on paper, you're making good choices. Like there could still be some issues that crop up by overdoing certain things as well, too. I don't know if you mentioned this or not, but sleep, how big of a role is that? Is that going to play in this too? Yeah, sleep did make my list. I would say the reason sleep's so important is just it's a key ingredient for overall recovery and modulating inflammation in the body. And it's also a time when you're not eating, which I know sounds crazy, but having clear breaks and time periods where you're not chewing, eating, stressing your digestive system, and then time when you are eating can be very important. So sleep is multifaceted. And not only are you not eating, there's this cellular cleanup that can happen. You're also modulating inflammation, which if you have systemic inflammation can exacerbate your gut health. And gut is well, your gut is really like an origin point of if you have poor gut health, it's an origin for inflammation as well. So sleep is very important. And what I also notice is because sleep is so crucial for appetite regulation and blood sugar control, that when we're not sleeping, it leads to deviations in blood sugar and appetite. And then I make different food choices. And then those food choices impact my gut health because I basically veered off and made a food choice I might not have otherwise picked. So sleep really, as much as it may seem less obvious, it's playing in a number of ways in terms of your overall health, inflammation, blood sugar, food choices. We all know that it's a lot easier to make a better nutrition decision when you've had a good night's rest, that you're less hungry, you're not maybe have like your normal appetite signals at the normal times, you are just feeling better for your training and like showing up like we've all, we even in your personal life, right? Like it's so much easier to even end up in disagreement with a friend or a partner when you don't get a good night's sleep. Getting a good night's sleep is a cornerstone for gut health, not necessarily because it's this like magic cure for it. Your gut is also part of your body. It does need to recover. It does need the sleep and restorative process as just any, all of our body needs that. So it is a cornerstone, but it's also something where I view it as like a domino effect of like when sleep goes out the window, we start to make different choices and behaviors. And even though sleep wasn't the choice, it led to the choice that then had a negative impact on gut health. So let's say it's reaching for an afternoon snack that doesn't sit well with you, but because you had a crappy night's sleep, you're doing that. Or you had a third cup of coffee and you're running to the bathroom because you only got five hours of sleep the night before. So it's more of a precursor that leads to this domino effect of other things happening down the chain for your gut. And I think sometimes that's overlooked. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Yeah, it's not like necessarily directly, but it's indirectly going to, like you said, going to cause other issues down the line. So I, I guess a, a good kind of place to go with this is like, how is this going to affect a body transformation, right? You Again, you're somebody that maybe you are like, you know, tracking your food, you're eating a high food volume. How is this going to impact like your ability to lose mu or lose body fat, build muscle and whatnot there on that side of things? So as far as their gut health and their ability to lose body fat, I'd say one of the most direct connections is going to be thyroid health and thyroid conversion. 
and also absorption of key micronutrients and the fact that having a systemic sort of inflammatory environment, intestinal permeability, it's not really going to be the most conducive for building muscle because when we have widespread issues like that, it's generally going to create this sort of physiological cascade that is we're devoting resources towards these other issues in the body. So to not get too far into the science, I'd say the biggest concern that we would have is a state of dysbiosis and poor microbiome health is not conducive to optimal micronutrient status. We need optimal micronutrient status, whether we have a muscle building goal or a fat loss goal. That's kind of case in point number one. Number two, that inflammation and nutrient deficiencies that will impact the thyroids are key metabolic driver. It is a energy regulating hormone. And so when you have compromised gut health, you typically see compromised thyroid conversion. And I'd also say part three is when we do have dysbiosis intestinal permeability, this basically just means our ratios of good bacteria, bad bacteria are skewed. And then we also have, in addition to that skewed profile, if we have a compromised gut barrier, and intestinal permeability that's activating our immune system. And when we activate the immune system, it's almost like synonymous with inflammation, but that is going to create an effect both at the brain and tissue level that is further compromising muscle building and fat loss. So just to keep it simple as takeaways from today's podcast and not coming up with 17 different reasons, I'd say number one would be micronutrients. Number two would be thyroid and other hormonal function. And three would be the impact on systemic inflammation and just overall health. Awesome. Yeah, I know that. I will sum that up. And I think, like you said, the micronutrients are going to be important there too, because you're not getting those. And those obviously play an important role. And like you said, losing body fat, building muscle. So I guess with this, what would be some kind of like low hanging fruits that people could do before they go into a when it, some sort of supplement or some detox protocol or something like that? Like what are some like low hanging fruits? And then maybe what would you say are like either common food irritants slash safer foods that you would say are on that list? Yeah. So what I would do is first assess both meal timing, meal spacing, and giving yourself ample opportunity to chew and eat attentively. There's plenty of research to support that improving gut health. The next thing that we need to consider on top of attentive eating and chewing your food would be going towards single ingredient food. So what I mean by that is if you have grass-fed beef or wild salmon or something, it's literally just beef. If you have a strawberry, it's a strawberry. If you have a blueberry, it's a blueberry. So single ingredient foods, meaning it doesn't have a laundry list of stuff in it, this just tends to trim a lot of irritants that way. If you're still having issues, the most common irritants are probably gluten, dairy, nuts, seeds, eggs, nightshade vegetables and uh, like corn and soy. I'm not sure if I mentioned those. Gluten, dairy, corn, soy, nightshade vegetables. Seeds can be an irritant to the GI and certain carbohydrates that kind of resemble that would also be, I've noticed like quinoa can be a problem if it's not like rinsed and stuff. So just grains that can be a little bit more irritating. But for the most part, that's your cornerstone list. Or if you're doing something silly, if you're eating, let's say your carb goals like 220 grams, but you're eating like 85 grams of fiber, the more obvious things like getting into your macro composition, I think that's something I would do. I would try to bring that down and get some easier to digest carbohydrate in there. Still could be single ingredient things, whether it's a potato or some fruit or some jasmine rice or something. Those are very easily digestible foods and they don't have as high a fiber content. Sometimes when I see people doing that, it's vegetables, but also a Quest bar and cauliflower rice and these different things that they're doing, but there's, it does still strain the digestive system. And it doesn't mean you can't eat a vegetable, but maybe you also occasionally have a vegetable that's a little lower fiber option, right? And it still has antioxidants or you're getting different colors in, but it's not necessarily the same as what you were consuming before. So that those food, common food irritants and different things, I'd consider making the switch from like a standard American diet or Western eating to more single ingredient foods, potentially looking at like attentive eating, chewing your meals and making sure you're chewing thoroughly, auditing your overall stress levels. And I'd also can include your training there. So you may notice improvements just simply taking a deload or going from five or six days a week of intense training, back it down to three or four for a couple of weeks, see how you do. Sometimes that can make a really big difference for people as well. 
Cool. Yeah. I think the meal timing one, and like you said, slowing down and chewing, that's one that I think most people struggle with and they're always eating on the go. And that's one that when I check in with clients, that seems to be something that most people do is just eat super quickly or eat and distract it. And I just feel like that's such like a low hanging fruit there that you can work on with that one. What about like hydration? Is that something too that could can play a role in this? Is that in something if someone's that's constipated? Good? Definitely. Or if you are experiencing frequent diarrhea or loose stool. So diarrhea will dehydrate you in terms of water and electrolytes. So you, you need to replenish that if you're having loose bowel movements. On the other end of the spectrum, constipation we need to make sure that we are consuming adequate water along with our fiber and carbohydrate intake. Hydration is always paramount in, on both sides of the spectrum. It's just for different, slightly different reasons. So hydration can definitely be one. And then what you mentioned in terms of people eating on the go, like just think of the client that's constantly eating like the bar in the car or trying to grab something macro friendly in like a convenience store or fast food or Nothing against some of the things that can be made more macro friendly. If you're someone who's like always trying to figure out going out to eat and making it fit your food log, preparing some meals at home, switching up the cooking oils, little things like that can really improve your gut health. So if you've been on the Chipotle bowl a day, protein bar in the car diet, you may need to switch things up to improve your gut health. And I've been there before. Looking back when I first got into health and fitness, it was like a lot of protein bars, a lot of protein powder. Chipotle and it was like, okay, no wonder. And then high stress and not managing that stress, doing a ton of training on top of it. It was like, okay, no wonder I was suffering from some of this stuff. To finish it up, maybe is there any good supplements or anything like that you can generally say can help with this? Or is it going to ultimately come down to the person and diving into that a little bit more? Yeah. So I don't really have like widespread supplement recommendations other than as I, I think you hit on it really nicely is sometimes if you're consuming a lower quality protein powder, that can irritate your gut because of different gums and sweeteners and additives and anti-caking agents and different things that are added to proteins or other supplements, right? So improving the quality of your supplement. And what I mean by that is just like you shouldn't have 25 different things in your protein powder. It should be like, if you have a plant protein, it probably should be like pea, brown rice, and a sweetener, like maybe a stevia or monk fruit or something. If you tolerate sucralose, that's fine. But like for most people, if you're having gut issues for plant, it's going to be pea, brown rice, some stevia, and maybe there's like a natural creamer that's in it. What I mean by that is maybe it's like a coconut oil based creamer or something like that adds a little bit of dietary fat and maybe a more easy to digest, very basic gum. The uh, Or on the other side, if you are consuming animal foods, like a whey, a whey protein isolate, that's naturally sweetened, minimal gums. So if you're having issues with your supplements, look there first, try to substitute protein bars for whole food ingredients where you can, or even something like you might even digest. Let's say you're trying to have protein on the go. Maybe you go with a fairly minimal ingredient, beef jerky instead of a protein bar, and you notice you digest that better. Cool. Let's make that substitution. So that's definitely something I would pay attention to. And then as far as other supplements, there are cases to be made for taking a probiotic when you've either been given antibiotics or if you're just looking to support a healthy microbiome or keep things in check. I wouldn't just randomly, like adding probiotics to gut health issues can be like bringing super soaker to a forest fire. So I wouldn't just randomly assign a probiotic, right? So we wanna make sure it's the right, right probiotic, right person, right time, right situation. Digestive enzymes and HCL can be helpful if you do have low stomach acid. Zinc carnosine can be helpful for gut permeability. But if you don't know what issues you have, don't randomly add this these supplements. I would start with the food and lifestyle interventions. My, I'll give you guys like a top five. Aside from the dietary aspects we already mentioned, because I think Jeff and I articulated those, I would say chewing your food, going for a short walk after your meals, being hydrated improving the quality of your supplements. So making sure they don't have a ton of like random crap added to the supplement. So if you're buying a protein powder, it shouldn't have 17 different fillers and fake cookie pieces and all these different things. Like just get a good quality protein powder and other supplements, good micronutrient status. So this might involve supplementing with some things. If you're deficient, if you're constipated, adding a good magnesium product can be great. But those would be, I'd say lifestyle-wise, biggest low-hanging fruit would be chewing your food and going for a walk after your meals. There's actually a study that came out, and I think it was in 2021, where 
going for a walk was equally as effective as medication for people suffering from digestive issues. I quote that one all the time because I'm like, guys, there's so much low hanging fruit. It's just, it's sometimes inconvenient to go for a walk after you eat dinner. You want to sit down, you're like hanging out on the couch, you don't feel like getting up. But if you actually eat dinner at the table, you pick your plate up, you put your plate away, just take yourself outside, do a little five minute walk and then sit on the couch, you're going to feel a lot better. So that's a big one. And then some of the other things we talked about today in terms of looking for those red flag foods, or if you're eating a lot of, like if you were, if you're Jeff right now, where he was doing like lots of protein bars, protein shakes, Chipotle, you can sub Chipotle with, I have a silly video about gut health where I was like, coach, I'm doing the four C's. It's like Chipotle, yeah. Chick-fil-A, coffee and Chick caffeine. Chick-fil-A so too, yeah. Kind of, yeah. So if you're just only trying to macro hack, I'd encourage you. It's not that you can't ever eat those foods. It's just, it shouldn't be like the 80 to 90% of your diet. Still have some stuff at home, or if you prefer, whether it's your meal prep or ordering something, trying to manage some of those extra, because even extra oils and things added to food can irritate some people. So it's all about finding what you tolerate best and then making substitutions to have that right recipe for you. And then you just supplement to uh, avoid any sort of deficiencies or address any problems that you might specifically have. Yeah, no, I love that. And that, that's a good summary of everything. What, one last thing, alcohol, how big of a role is that going to, how is that's probably going to impact gut health as well too. Yeah, alcohol is going to be multifaceted. I think in small amounts in moderation, it could be fine. Personally, I choose not to drink super frequently and I don't really drink very much. I'm not really an alcohol advocate. If it's something that's consumed very frequently in large amounts or you find that a lot of your social activities are revolving around it, I would encourage you to either remove it or take it down for a period of time and see how your health improves. I think a lot of people are skeptical or they hate on the idea of reducing alcohol, but you can drastically fast track your body composition goals, your training and your gut health by reducing alcohol. And it's not it's not like a lot of people argue about alcohol because of the calories. It's not really the calories. It's it impacts your sleep architecture. It impacts your body heat, which impacts your sleep architecture. It can create a predisposition to more micronutrient deficiencies, like, for example, zinc in men, which is important for testosterone and fertility. It's largely as much as it's a social lubricant and numbing agent that people will use. It's really it's non nutritive in nature. It's not going to be that great. It contains calories, but there's no real large nutritional benefit other than what you're doing from a social perspective. So I really, if someone's having gut issues, I typically will remove alcohol for a minimum of four weeks. And that's just my rule of thumb. I know some coaches do it differently, but if I could, honestly, I would do it four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, depending on the client and how bad the gut issues are, because it's really not doing us any favors. And so if someone's got really significant gut issues, if it's not a net positive, I'm going to remove it. Unless it's just like neutral or positive, those are the only things I'm keeping. If there's even a chance that something's remotely harming that person in terms of how they feel, I'm probably going to nix it as long as we can structure the lifestyle accordingly to make that work. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like alcohol is probably the opposite of sleep where it's like sleep's indirectly going to help with everything and make it better, whereas alcohol is going to do the opposite. It's not necessarily the calories. It's just everything else that's going to come along with it that, that can impact it. And it's it's marginal, but it stacks up over time, right? So it's the same thing with going for a walk or getting to sleep. There are these like five to 10% things, but if you do them all the time over and over again for days and weeks and months and years, you're like an entirely different person. And so the same thing is true of drinking, but in the opposite direction. If you do it day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, did the one drink, the one time, like ruin your physique? No, but could it have consequences long term and impact your decision making and your relationships and getting to bed on time and your quality of sleep, training the next day when you don't feel 100%, your progressive overload? Yeah, I do think it adds up over time. And as much as there's mixed research out there, just anecdotally as a coach, the people I've seen get better results over the years are typically ones who are not centering everything around alcohol or trying to fit alcohol in all the time or having it be a focal point of their nutrition. It might be something where if there's a special occasion, celebration, wedding or anniversary or because otherwise you're, there's always going to be something. A friend is always going to have a thing. There's always going to be a holiday. It's going to be a long weekend we're recording this over the summer, there's always going to be some summer thing where there's probably alcohol involved. And so the more frequently it starts to sneak in there, 
it starts to just become your norm. And so you just have to be careful uh, on how that might be impacting things. And also it just impacting your other health related behaviors and decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Be, being selective with it, I think is important, right? Rather than just, oh, hey, it's here. I'm going to just drink anyways. Cool, Sam. A ton of great information in here about gut health. I feel like that's really going to help people go through the weeds and make sure that they're not overlooking some things. And again, just because you're eating healthy and trying to change your body doesn't mean your gut health is going to be in a good spot. A ton of great information in here. Before I let you go anywhere where the audience can find you or anything like that. So aside from our podcast on stress that Jeff and I did that I definitely encourage you to check out, I'm Sam Miller Science on every major platform. My website, sammillerscience.com. Podcast is Sam Miller Science on Instagram. The book is Metabolism Made Simple, and you can find that at metabolismmadesimple.com. But all of those are great ways to start consuming any content that I've put out. And then beyond that, like if you're interested in learning more, I certainly have more on my Instagram website and podcast as far as next steps beyond that. But I really appreciate you having me, Jeff, and definitely a great conversation and great questions about gut health and digestion. Yep, absolutely. And I know you're also doing class, like you'll do like webinar workshops and classes from time to time as well, too. But obviously people can find that on your podcast and Instagram and stuff. Well, Sam, appreciate your time in and we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Thanks, Jeff.